I've been asked to give the uh, short speech, Why EduLARP? Uh, and before I start with that, I want to zoom out a little bit. Um, the world is a complex place, but we still live in a time of simplicities. Um, we have uh, links we share on Facebook to articles that provide simple, simplified answers to uh, complicated issues. And we have pundits in the media that take complex world events and they turn it into simplified answers. And we have politicians who pr promise simple solutions to complex problems. Uh, and I'm not the only one who thinks this is a problem. So the question why EduLARP, it looks like a very simple question, but the answer is complex, I find. I often talk about how EduLARPs work and, and why they are effective. Uh, I think they're a great tool for learning and there's a lot of pedagogical theory I can, I can cite when I talk about that. I can, I can talk about uh, Piaget and the socio-cognitive uh, perspective on learning. I can talk about how we organize new information into schema through the processes of assimilation and accommodation. Uh, I can go to Lev Vygotsky and talk about the socio-cultural perspective on learning, how social roles and expectations shape our behavior uh, and how new roles can help us expand the proximal zone of development. Uh, and I can go to Albert Bandura and I can talk about self-efficacy theory and how believing in your own ability to master something uh, is important for deploying effective uh, metacognitive learning strategies. And if I want to, I can even go to Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and talk about the concept of flow, how when you have a perfect merge between the challenge of the task and your skill level, you go into this state where you completely uh, fall out of, or you completely forget the world around you and you only focus on the task at hand and how similar that is to what LARPers call immersion. But I think that's answers to the questions, why do EduLARPs work? And, and the question here is why EduLARP? And the answer, it just works, isn't a very good answer. It's a really simple answer, uh, but the question is complex. So instead I'll go to another pedagogue. This is Wolfgang Klafke. Uh, and he's worked with practical didactics. Uh, and uh, he uses, uh, he's, he's German, and he uses this German term called Bildung. In Norway we say Dannelse. And in English they don't really have a word for it. Uh, but sort of a translation. Uh, a rough translation would, would be uh, the, see here, I have to look in notes here, no, <laughs> no uh, roughly it can be translated into self-cultivation. Uh, and Klafke, he separates Bildung into two different parts. He talks about material Bildung and formal Bildung, where the material Bildung is, is focused around uh, the things you need to know, like the, the knowledge you need to fit into society, while the formal building is, is more the things you need to not just grow as a person, but grow into a person. Uh, and where material building uh, focuses uh, on the content of the knowledge you need to acquire, the formal building is more about your ability to acquire new knowledge. And Klafke has uh, a holistic view on building. He says we need both of them. We, they can't exist uh, on their own uh, and without each other. And we also live in a time where politicians are uh, increasingly uh, 
hung up on measuring knowledge, measuring our education system, measuring if, if it's effective. This is the PISA results on the reading from 2006. The PISA uh, report is a study that's done uh, in several nations, all the OECD countries at the same time. Uh, and each year, or each time they do it, they measure a different thing and, and they measure reading and writing, uh, and they measure mathematics, uh, and they measure uh, the natural sciences. Uh, and politicians want to measure learning because they have this philosophy that if you can't measure it, then you can't improve it. Uh, and while like, the goal of this approach might be noble, they also ignore one important part uh, of system theory, which is what you get is what you measure. Uh, <laughs> so when they focus on these uh, very concrete tasks that are easy to compare between nations, the reading and writing, the mathematics and the natural sciences, you get more of those things. Uh, and it's, it's an easy way to provide simple answers for the politicians. We are good at reading, we are bad at maths, we are okay at natural sciences, and Finland is better than us at all of them. <laughs> um, so the PISA test is great for material building, uh, but the formal building gets left behind. I'm going to do a slight detour here, and I'm going to quote the American novelist uh, David Foster Wallace. He says that there is no experience you have had that you are not the absolute center of. There is no experience you have had that you are not the absolute center of. And in psychology, there's this concept called the fundamental error of attribution. And what that means is that when we uh, look at other people's actions, we tend to attribute their behavior to their personalities and not to their circumstances. Mm -hmm. when, when we think about our own actions, we always look at our circumstances because the circumstances they happen within uh, are obvious to us. Uh, but when, for example, someone cuts us off in traffic, our first impulse is just to think asshole. Uh, we don't think, oh, maybe they have a plane to catch, or oh, maybe they have just gotten the phone call that their child has had an accident. Uh, but if we cut someone off in traffic, there's always a good reason why we need to do that. Uh, and that's, that's the uh, attribution error, because our whole lives are first-person uh, experiences. It's just a series of first-person experiences. Uh, so, it's very, very difficult to take the perspective of someone else. It's a skill that we have to practice, and we have to practice, and we have to practice, uh, and we never get perfect at it, because we can only know our own lives fully. So I will return to the question of why EduLARP, because with the PISA uh, results and the PISA tests, when you only measure like the, the hard knowledge the thing that gets left behind are the aesthetic subjects and the aesthetic curriculum. Because you get more maths and more uh, language and more sciences, you also get less arts and you get less crafts and you get less music. And the good thing about the aesthetic subjects is that they teach us reflection and they teach us introspection and they also provide us with this skill to see something from a different perspective. And I think that's why EduLARP 
is good because LARP is all about putting someone in a position where they can see some, something from a different perspective. You can literally put someone in the shoes of someone else. You can take your students and you can give them, uh, you can put them into a role that's very different from who they are, or you can put them into a situation that's very different from uh, the life they live themselves. And, and that's great for teaching, uh, teaching them empathy. And it's great for providing sort of mental hooks that they can hang all the facts they need on top of. And uh, it, it's also fun. It's, it's a way to make uh, education more exciting. But I think the most important thing it teaches students is that sometimes the world looks very different for different people. And that can teach you that there are always shades of grey. That what looks simple at first might be quite complex uh, when you think about it. And while I don't think that's the only answer to the question why Edularp, I think it's one answer and I think it's a good answer for the times we live in today. Thank you.